Okay, well, let me tell you a little about the, uh, the polluting of man and uh, where this program really seemed to have a benefit to overall health and wellness. And uh, we'll take it from there and get specific to your own uh, past history if, if you'd like. Essentially, what this program deals with, Tim, is the types of substances which come into contact with the human physiology and are ingested. Now, that can be through dermal, touch, respiratory, uh, orally through ingestion of food or pharmaceutical substances and so on. And essentially what the program seems to, un to uniquely address are those substances which are of an oil-based nature. And without getting into a whole 101 chemistry lecture, I just refresh your memory on some of the basic things. Essentially, certain substances that we take in our body are water-soluble, like salt. They'll dissolve in water and flush through your bile, your urine, uh, and so on. Other substances that you take into your body are oil-soluble, much like oil and water. They don't easily digest or flush through the water-based systems of the body. Now, depending upon that type of substance and where it's come from and how it's chemically been designed, it can have even a more persistent nature. In other words, it doesn't easily respond to the body's metabolic processes of digestion and metabolization. And therefore, what happens when you have an oil-soluble substance doesn't matter whether it's pharmacological in nature, drug, food, pesticide, what have you, that's designed to persist. It will enter the body and go to the one oil-based system the body has. And that's known as the adipose tissue, okay, which is the fatty tissue. Oh, that's, so that's just the fat in the body. Exactly. That's the fat, and I'm not particularly heavy or anything, but we all have fat in our body. In fact, your brain and my brain is about two and, two and three quarters pounds of fatty tissue. It's the insulator in the brain. So uh, as we'll see in a little bit, many of these chemicals can have a neurotoxic effect as well. Okay, so what the program seems to address very effectively are these fatty stored body burdens of chemicals that can accumulate there from the time we were like one years old. In fact, they can actually be prenatal since some of these chemicals are passed through a mother's placenta and mammary milk. So let's talk about just the subject of chemical exposure and get a little feeling for that. Since World War II, uh, this country has produced synthetic, synthetically chemicals up to about 6,000 different compounds a week. Mm -hmm. So if you multiply that for the years since World War II, that's a tremendous amount of chemicals that are being manufactured. Now, that's not to say chemicals produce our standard of living. You know, the carpeting here, this, this synthetic board, they have contributed dramatically to our standard of living. However, it's virtually impossible with that kind of chemical production going on to track the human health effects. And so let's talk about a couple of those examples of where we found out later. For instance, let's take the, uh, the chemical D, D, T. Right. Okay, you've probably heard those. Right, it's a pesticide. And uh, it was sprayed on our food for years as a uh, deterrent to various pests in the fields and in the, in the, in the uh, vegetable gardens and, and, and the like. And many people used a form of this chemical right in their home garden, not just on the major fields here in California or back east. Now, the, the chemical, when it's ingested, because it's oil soluble, because it's designed not to particularly break down easily, will go and lodge in your fat tissue. Well, it was found out after years of using it that it had a very adverse effect, particularly on birds and, and animal lives, and also that it could be a potential carcinogenic or cancer-causing agent or muta mutagenic, mutant mutation-causing agent in a human being. So it was banned from use now in the United States. Mm -hmm. But remember, we used to go home, take our vegetables from the grocery store, wash them with water, so they were cleaned off of pesticides. Well, this is an oil-soluble chemical. So the water did very little to it. Okay, so we ingested it. Now, that's just one example. We have yet to see one individual in the United States who has had a fat sample taken out of his body and analyzed under very sophisticated instrumentation that did not have recordable levels of DDT in his fatty tissue. This is, these are healthy, well human beings. They weren't necessarily on a farm or working in a DDT plant, okay? Now, an interesting thing enough, uh, interesting enough here in Southern California, this chemical is still present. 
particularly. The, the chemicals manufactured still in the United States, in fact, here in the LA area, but it's exported to third world countries. And so what happens is Mexico gets it and uses it. So sometimes maybe the salad bars we're going into here in Los Angeles, okay, they got their, the vegetables from Mexico, have DDT on it. Mm. Okay, so it's not a gone chemical yet. But you're uh, saying even if, uh, even if you don't have direct exposure to it, it still stays in your fat tissue somewhere. Exactly. So for instance, we're not being, let's say we're not eating DDT uh -huh. pesticides uh, today. We would most likely, based upon tests done to date, find it in your fatty tissue from years ago consumption. In other words, it, it accumulates and persists there in your fatty tissue. Another example you've probably heard about in the news. Uh, PCBs, yes. okay. It stands for polychlorinated biphenyls. This was a chemical invented in 1929 by Monsanto Chemical and has been used as an additive to oil in electrical devices, okay, to make that oil increase its lubricating capability. Now, it was designed specifically to persist and not break down at high, at high temperatures uh, or revolutions or friction rates. Uh, it takes 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit to break this molecule down when well, we don't surely have that in our body. Now, people don't go around directly ingesting PCBs, but there can be fine in a colored television capacitor. The, t the capacitors and transformers you see right down your neighborhood uh, on your telephone poles. Uh, it, there's evidence now that PCBs are in the, the transistor capacitors in a fluorescent light bulb and that they're emitted into the air. This chemical is so persistent that when it enters the food chain, a transformer breaks near a, a water source. It gets into the fish in the ocean from a pollution source. Uh, it's spread uh, in, a, in a field. When it comes up the food chain, so the soil, the water, into animal, into meat, into vegetables, and it gets to us, it stays there. It persists. Again, like DDT, there's hardly been any individual check for PCB concentrations in their fat tissue that we didn't find high amounts. Okay, and again, it's a suspected carcinogenic material. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, if this, if these chemicals are so hard to, to break down and get out, uh, how does this, how does this program um, affect them? I mean, are you saying that this program will get them out when 2,100 degrees wouldn't do it? Well, yes, and uh, I'll get into that and how that works. Essentially, what we're looking at is that man is being bombarded. Not, I just gave you two examples of uh, persistent uh, environmental chemicals. But we can talk about trichloroethylene that was used to dry clean our clothes for years, that's dermal absorptive. We can talk about various drug metabolites. We're seeing now the THC, the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. Uh, some metabolites of cocaine, possibly. PCP, angel dust. These, Valium, uh, certain metabolites of methadone. These things, by actual chemical construction, can actually be seen or known that they will persist. They will go to the fatty tissue and they persist. One of the reasons they do that is the body doesn't want them circulating around in the blood. Plus, it's a water-based system. So they'll go there and almost be compartmented away, which sounds like a pretty good defense mechanism. However, what happens? We mobilize fat. Okay, we mobilize fat and therefore toxins in that when we're under stress. When we have a lot of cardiovascular stimulation, like either an exercise or upset, what have you. We mobilize fat when we sleep. Uh, we mobilize fat when we haven't eaten too much. We know that fat mobilization increases when you're under stress or illness. So these chemicals are not just there dormant forever. They will circulate through your body. One of the things we're seeing is that, for instance, drug flashbacks. You've probably heard that terminology. Yes. Well, that looks to be, the source of that looks to be these drug metabolites. Obviously, they're less in concentration than the initial ingestion, but years after the person ever took that drug, under a stress period or a given situation, will mobilize and cause a drug phenomena. It might not be as intense as the trip he had on a drug and so on, but nevertheless is present. Now, I mentioned the idea of the neurological system. So many of these chemicals are neurotoxic. In other words, they can affect your neurotransmission in the sense of your psychometric profile. We see evidence now that these chemicals over a long period of life, 20, 30, 40 years, have an insidious effect in the sense that they can depress IQ. 
depressed neurological response time. They might even actually cause changes in personality profile. And so the hypothesis is if there's some way to reduce these levels or eliminate them entirely, that that would be better for the overall human wellness picture. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's sort of the hypothesis we began this at, with. Now, in 1975, 76, L. Ron Hubbard, he's the author of Dianetics, uh, wrote this program, okay? He designed this program, okay, as a method of reducing these levels of toxicity. And research has been done on this program. Let me explain a few things there so you understand. <coughs> this program purports to do what no other types of detoxification can do. For instance, you've probably heard of a fast. Okay, like, you, done have you done a fast? Yeah. Like a juice fast where you fast and do juices and so on? Yeah. They're very good. I mean, I think that properly done under the right medical supervision at the right time in a person's health profile, that's probably a good idea. Uh, however, let's take a look at a fast, okay? Uh, you stop eating. So immediately you mobilize fat. Now, let me ask you, when you got day two or three into the fast, how'd you feel? Well, gee, on about the third day I got real spaced out and I felt, I felt sick. I actually felt ill but I knew that was sort of a, a, a reaction that I was supposed to get mm -hmm. and uh, I went through it and it seemed then I actually felt much better later on and I, I think what that was was some of this chemicals and whatnot coming out. Right and from a toxicology point of view Tim what you're looking at there in terms of a fast is you're mobilizing certain toxins and there's some evidence that in a fast certain metals for particularly that are more water soluble will come out but you're mobilizing a lot of these oil soluble chemicals so they're passing around in your serum or blood levels and then going back to the fat so you can get an actual over toxic type reaction so when the Hubbard method was developed it became of real interest to toxicologists in the country physicians in the country in that it purported at that time to reduce these oil soluble fat stored levels okay and so a lot of research started to self generate in an independent fashion to the program to examine can it actually do this and so that's easy enough to do for instance let me give you an example over simplistically stated uh, and an independent medical research foundation here in Los Angeles, the Foundation for Advancements in Science and Education, did some of this testing. Dr. Dan Rehm in Florida, he did some other testing similar to this. But if I took a sample of your fat, okay, with a needle, a hollow needle, it's called a needle aspiration biopsy from your buttocks, and we an fat being basically homogeneous in terms of what toxins would be present. And we analyzed that. We could analyze those actual toxic levels, whether they be drug related, environmental chemically related, before, put you through the program, and analyze it after. Mm -hmm. Now that would tell us, rather than, say, making a claim about the program, or we see some things like, you know, that look a little dubious today, but that would tell us empirically whether we're getting a reduction. Have you actually done this? Well, Yes, this has been done. And what we have found is that on chemicals like these, which are known not to reduce at all over eight and ten years, of people doing nutrition, fast, diet, exercise, all these kinds of good health things, vitamins and so forth, these chemicals don't reduce normally. So if we took a fat sample before and analyzed it specifically for chemicals, put the person through this program, analyzed this fat at the end, you could tell. Now obviously you'd do some other controls. You'd have some control individuals to check that. You'd check the blood, the urine to make sure you're not just mobilizing it into the blood and then it comes back to the fat and you'd do follow-up biopsies. And all that has extensively been done, okay, uh, by research groups like uh, the Foundation for Advancements in Science Education. And what we have found is one of the most significant breakthroughs, in my opinion, in human toxicology, because these levels have been reduced significantly. In a, pr it's in a safe manner, in a program that lasts normally 10 to 20 days, uh, we've seen dramatic reductions in these chemicals. More interesting, from a personal point of view that might interest you, a dramatic improvement in an individual's overall well-being. In other words, we're seeing like increases in IQ. Well, we don't claim to be increasing IQ, but there seems to be a suppressive neurotoxic effect that's being alleviate, alleviated there or, or, or mitigated to some degree. 
We've seen a dramatic improvement in personality profiles, psychological profiles. We've seen a tremendous improvement in neurological response time, how fast you can react to a given situation. Uh, not to mention dramatic, these are subjectively reported uh, things to our physicians, but dramatic increases in energy levels. One of the most significant and interesting areas is we know that a lot of these chemicals, environmental and drugs, have an immunosuppressant aspect to them. And what I mean by that is they suppress the body's immune system. Well, I don't, let me just briefly give you what I'm talking about when I say immune system. We each have an immune system. Simply, it's known as the T lymphocyte system, which is a form of a white blood cell, okay? And there's things called helper lymphocytes and suppressor lymphocytes and all that. But without getting into a whole course in immunology, that's why we could go out in today's world and fight off virus, infection, bacteria, certain disease. We have a natural immunity. Dr. Walter Brzezinski from UCLA once told me, he said, Michael, we probably each beat a carcinogenic reaction six to eight times a day mm -hmm. with our natural immune system. Now, why do some people get cancer and some people don't? Well, I guess it's a combination of, you know, what their, you know, emotional background is, what's their genetic background, are they doing things that increase their odds and so on. But that's why we don't walk out into the world and have to live under a glass bubble. And we know people that have an immune deficiency, and you've probably seen this, they literally do have to live under a glass bubble, okay? So that's the ultimate in immune deficiency or suppression. But take things like allergies, for instance. They basically are an admission of the immune system that it's compromised. Take something even more acute, AIDS. Total compromise of the immune system. Well, we know, maybe it's not a direct causal relationship, that we know that these chemicals and these drug metabolites are immunosuppressant. So they're surely not helping your immune system, okay? What we're finding by patient report and physician examination on patients that have gone through this program is a dramatic report of a buoyance to the immune system. And what I mean by that is people report a reduction of their allergy symptoms. We've actually seen in cases with blood analysis an improvement in their total lymphocyte count or white blood cell count, which are good indications of immunity. So we're seeing tremendous uh, changes on our patients there. Uh, more subjectively, they report a dramatic increase of energy. Well, you would imagine if they had been carrying a toxic burden around for them, you know, around with them for 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years, that the reduction of those would give them a sense of clarity, uh, purity, uh, of buoyancy and energy level. And we're seeing that. Uh, so the results are interesting. I see. That sounds pretty good. Um, I'm generally pretty healthy. I don't mm -hmm. really uh, get sick very often or anything. To tell you the truth, the reason I came here was one of my friends who, we used to take drugs uh, a while back, and I've taken LSD and cocaine and marijuana. And I don't really do it anymore, but um, we had similar reactions. I would get in a, a stress situation, or I would go without sleep, let's say, and I would just feel foggy or uh, spaced out, I guess, or, or just bad in general. Mm -hmm. And these things would happen sometimes when they were the least appropriate, like before a presentation or something like that. And, and it interests me uh, because I do believe that I, somehow this is like a flashback um, and just what this program could do for, for that, say like LSD or, or marijuana or, or something like that. Well, essentially what the program is designed to do, okay, is to mobilize any stored drug or environmental chemicals. Now, one thing I might mention as a side before I go on is if you take a drug history like that, okay, and of course I'll treat what you've told me confidentially, you know, in a medical chart, but if you take a drug history like that and you add to it chemicals that we know all of us are accumulating in our bodies, you've got a witch's brew. So it's much like the environmental situation of Love Canal. All these chemicals were put in there and a top put on. And some of the chemicals that came out of that, that site were even worse than what were put in because there was a chemical reaction going on. So you've got a witch's brew going on. Add to that like a higher than normal drug history either because of med medication or social, you know, street use of drugs. You've got a real problem. The program is designed to mobilize those drug metabolites, environmental chemicals, and systematically provide a system to eliminate them from the system. Okay, so I think that we're seeing, particularly professional people like yourself, who might have back in the 60s or the early 70s 
had an experience or an interface with drug use, we're seeing dramatic benefits. And what's really interesting is you'll find people who haven't done drugs in five, six, seven years. They won't even take aspirin anymore. It's sort of like everybody's got, gotten religion, you know. Uh, used to do all these things. Now I'm on a health food diet and nutrition and vitamins and so on. But we'll see them day three, day four in the program. On this program, they'll actually have a drug experience, a full-blown LSD phenomena, the visual patterns that are reported, that type of thing. Now what I will say is that reactions are always less intense and much less in duration. And they're usually here because of the way the program works under our supervision. So it's not like a very scary thing. And that's why the supervision of this program is so very important. And let me tell you a little about the program and how it works, OK? And uh, the Hubbard method is a very exact thing. What I can say is that the independent research that's been done on it has been done on the program as an integral whole. So I can't tell you biochemically which piece of what I'm going to tell you, which component of this program does the most for what, OK? Because that will be research well into the future. But what I can tell you is the program done exactly as, as Hubbard wrote it originally produces the results that have been clinically recorded. So I can't tell you exactly what this component or that component does. But essentially and simplistically, the program consists of three components, OK? Aerobic stimulation. What I mean by that is we're not talking aerobic class or anything. We're talking about continual movement for 12 minutes or more. That will, we know, the literature is very clear, will occasion a fat mobilization. You'll start to mobilize fat from the fatty stores you know, in your body to the blood, OK, from aerobic stimulation. The program calls for nicotinic acid, which is vitamin B3, niacin, OK, on very exact dosages. I might add that all this is, pre, is preambled with full phys physician diagnosis, blood, blood analysis, toxic analysis, any kinds of diagno medical diagnostics that are required. So we understand where you are. Exactly. Are there any nutritional deficiencies, any blood abnormalities, any particularly high acute levels of toxicity? So we really understand you. It's tailored to you. Okay? And from that, we'll know where to start you in terms of nutritional dosages and so on. But back to the nicotinic acid. Nicotinic acid has been reported clearly in the literature, medical literature, to have an interesting effect on fat mobilization. Simplistically, what it does is after a short, for a short period of time after ingestion, it suppresses fat mobilization. But like so many substances or supplements that we do, after that there's a rebound effect where your fat mobilization dramatically increases on a rebound. So here you have a person aerobically moving. OK, now that could be brisk walking or running. We find the best results from running if a person doesn't have a physical exercise restriction that the physician's seen. Uh, so you mobilize fat through the aerobic movement. You exaggerate that even further with nicotinic acid use. And those dosages of that will increase over the course of the program, which lasts, like I said, 10 to 20 days normally on the average. Uh, if you're going to take any vitamin or mineral supplement, and this is very clearly reported, you better balance it to the individual specifically. Because if you don't, you'll throw the person nutritionally imbalanced. In other words, it's like if you just took one vitamin, high amounts of one vitamin you throw your other vitamins off in balance in your body. So you balance this nicotinic acid with other antioxidant vitamins and minerals that are known as antioxidants. In other words, having a, a good detoxification property themselves. Vitamin C, beta carotene, vitamin A, C. Uh, we use uh, mineral sorbic Cs, uh, buffered on your tummy and, and, and so forth. Uh, B complexes, certain amounts of D, selenium, minerals that are chelated. And these are all very exact. And these all have their own detoxification properties. So you've got a fat mobilization occasioned with nicotinic acid usage, uh, aerobic stimulation. Then we're going to add a couple of other mineral supplements to you, which uh, were in the original Hubbard program, which is you know, exactly how we do it. Uh, there's an oil component. It's a polyunsaturated, cold-pressed, all-natural oil. It's really interesting. This is a very important part of the program. And it's, again, to your metabolism, your weight, and so on. It's very carefully supervised. And the oil taken in does an interesting thing. The body has trouble letting go of fat. In other words, and, and, and so what the oil component does is supply an, a fatty acid source 
so that essentially, this is real simplistically stated, but you're going to take toxic fat and let it go and replace it with clean fat. That's an oil supplementation uh, that's provided. Now, this has been st shown in studies to actually, if you increase an oil uh, component like this in a person's diet, you will get a fatty acid exchange. I think Battelle Laboratories did some work on this. So you're actually occasioning a fatty acid exchange. Another very important part of that is that because of the oil component, there is a bile salt exchange that goes on, obviously, and that's clearly shown in the literature. So you can anticipate and expect a dramatic increase through lower intestine of fecal excretion during the program. That's one of the components. Another is a calcium magnesium liquid that's put in an acetic acid base so that those very well-known uh, minerals for chemically bonding to toxins are more assimilated into the body using an acetic acid like vinegar or citric acid type of base. You take all that and you have to then supply a dramatic exaggerated excretion route. And we use heat to do that. And for practical reasons, obviously, a dry sauna. Now, when I say sauna, it's not like your health club sauna, which is 200, 210 degrees. They don't ventilate it because it costs money to ventilate a sauna. You're paying for the heat. This sauna that we use here in a therapeutic fashion uh, is usually 130 to 140 degrees. So you're looking probably 60 to 70 degrees less than a normal health club sauna. Plus, it's highly ventilated. And a person will go in there to the sauna, and it does, two th well, it does three things, actually. Because it will slightly raise cardiovascular rate, it will keep this fat mobilization going to a degree because you're, you're, you know, your heart's working a little harder. Uh, as well, is it dramatically has been shown, oh, obviously will increase your sweat excretion route. So you're literally sweating this stuff out. Uh, but another thing that's not so commonly known is that we have a sebaceous gland essentially everywhere we have a hair follicle on our body. That's an oil gland. And we, excre we excrete oil every day. Uh, from those glands. Now, many of them are clogged. A lot of times, a lot of evidence shows that one of the reasons people get acne is because the oil gland gets clogged with a toxin and it erupts into an acne condition. But we don't excrete as probably as well as we can, but there is an oil route. Well, heat has been shown to dramatically increase that oil excretion route. So the person goes into the sauna, comes out, goes in, comes out, cools down. I mean, the whole purpose is not to bake the person. It's just to increase dramatically these excretion routes. And it does. So the person will go in the sauna and they come out and they'll cool down, take a cooler shower, lukewarm shower, go back in, come in, go out. And the program will run anywhere from two and a half to five hours a day, depending upon, first of all, your own schedule, you know, what time you can put in, two, uh, the physician's recommendations as to what kind of stress or, uh, you know, he wants, and, uh, 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 and your own physical limitations, and, and drug and medical history. The results are outstanding. It works, it reduces these levels, it does it safely.